What if I told you that you could change the world? What if I told you that me and you together, we could live our lives in such a way that by the time Jesus calls us home, this world will be a better place than it was before we left? When you consider the state of our nation, are you satisfied? When you consider the things that are happening in our city, are you okay with that? How about your heart? How about your own home? I believe, I believe in a God who wants us to encounter him in such a way that something will be different in your life, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your city, in this world because of encountering the living God. What if I told you that God could use you to change the world? But what if I told you that in order for that to happen, it would cost you your very life? I don't mean physical death. I mean something far deeper. Your heart. Your affections. Your hopes. Your dreams. If God could use you to change this world at the cost of some of the things you hold most dear, would you do it? This is where God is taking us today. We have to make this choice, whether you realize it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not. Hopefully from this day forward, you will not be able to ignore this anymore. But I'm convinced that every single day, we have an opportunity to bring in more love and joy and peace and glory into this world or contribute to more pain and neglect and evil and suffering. And we need to choose how we are going to respond and what we are going to do with the opportunities God's placed before us. This world is filled with pain. We can't avoid that. That's why we're in the middle of a series that we've called How Long, O Lord? We're talking about a hope that heals in a world that hurts. This morning we're going to consider how do we navigate through suffering when we're sinned against? We've been looking at, uh, at specific, specific kinds of suffering, and this morning we're going to face a kind of suffering that, unfortunately, every one of us will have to deal with one way or another at one time or another. What are you going to do when somebody hurts you and it's not your fault? So with that, let me pray. I want God to speak to us this day. God, I thank you that before the reading and proclamation of your word, we were able to spend time gathered in your presence, affirming our belief in you, that you have paid it all, that you are our hope, that we need you, and it is sweet to trust in you. God, let these words that we have sung resonate deep in our soul now. Father, I, I know we will be considering things this morning that none of us want to consider. And so I pray that you would show us how to trust you in the dark nights. I pray that you would show us, give us the confidence to follow you in the hard times. God, let, your, let us have such a firm confidence in your cross that your light could shine through our lives in the middle of darkness. 
And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can open up to Genesis chapter 50. That's 5-0, Genesis 50. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 15 through 21. Uh, we're going to catch the tail end of uh, Joseph's story this morning. If you don't have a Bible, that's all right. There are some in the back. Otherwise, the words are on the screen. So this is Genesis chapter 50, and I will start reading in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave us this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of your servants, of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we're your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Now for my money, there is no place in the Bible that gives us a more clear path of how to, how to follow God through being hurt unfairly than this story right here. You can read the entire backstory in Genesis 37 through 50. I would highly encourage you to carve out some time to just read through that whole story at some point this week. It's fascinating. It's got to be one of the best stories ever written. Pain. Betrayal. Redemption. Reconciliation. It's beautiful. Now in Genesis 50, as the story concludes, we see that Joseph has been sinned against. As, you, as we read these handful of verses here, you see that the author is making it clear that everybody is on the same page. No one's pretending that Joseph wasn't sinned against. That people did not intend to do evil to him. His brothers hold a private conference and they say, hey, we better be careful because we've done some bad things here and Joseph might, now that, now that he's in a position to do something about it, he might get us back. They admit that. They, they admit that privately. They confess that to him personally. And Joseph responds by saying, look, I get it. Yeah, you're right. You did sin against me. So nobody's skirting around this issue here. This is a story of a man who was wrongfully hurt. He the disproportionately sinned against. And when this happens to you, which it probably has already, and if it has not, if it is not happening in your life right now, it will. And when these things happen to you, when people hurt you and you didn't deserve it, when people sin against you and it wasn't your fault, when people accuse you of things you've never done, how are you going to respond? How are you going to walk through this? I think these handful of verses let us scratch the surface. Uh, I think actually they answer these questions deeply, but in this context we'll only be able to scratch the surface. I think that this passage gives us two questions to answer. Why do these things happen? And how do we navigate through them when they do? Why and how? First, why? You weren't designed to be sinned against, right? Like there is, you can be a total jerk and you still don't deserve people sinning against you. Our souls weren't designed for this. Our hearts weren't designed for this. And so when people sin against you, when they slander you, when they betray you, when they take advantage of you, 
when these things happen to you, it shocks your soul. You like you just you just don't get used to that. It hurts. And you start to wonder why. And instinctively, I start to ask God, why are you letting this happen? What have I done to deserve this? Did I hurt them? Did I mislead them? Did I do something wrong to make them say this to me or not do this for me or whatever? Start to ask these kinds of questions. And then you can start to doubt whether or not God's in this situation at all. Right? Because it's like, don't, don't, we just believe that if we're following God, if we're obeying him, if we're doing the right things, then good things should happen to us. And when good things don't happen to us, when injustice is committed against us, well, know where's God and all that? Why would God allow that? But we must be careful here. Because part of the reason that we question God's goodness when we suffer is that we wrongly believe that the reason God exists is to make me happy. That's God's job. God has a, has a wonderful plan for my life and he needs to make me happy. Christian Smith says that our, our culture has really kind of morphed into this uh, uh, spiritual idea of, of how God functions and who he is. He was, uh, Christian Smith was one of the first people, I think, to be able to, to identify what's happening in our culture right now. And in his book, Soul Searching, he said that in America right now, people tend to have a view of God that he coined the term of uh, moralistic, therapeutic deism. People believe in a God, but it's moralistic, therapeutic deism. And he says that an entire generation believes these five things about some sort of a supreme being. Most people do believe in some sort of a God. And they tend to believe these five tenets about this God. Now, if you were going to try to uh, uh, hold anybody accountable to these beliefs, they'd probably push back against you because no postmodern relativist would ever say they absolutely believe anything. But (laughs) if you challenge these ideas, they'll bristle. Here's the five tenets of moralistic therapeutic deism. Number one, God exists And he created and ordered the world, and he now does watch over human life. Two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair. He wants them to do that, treat each other that way, as the Bible teaches, and so do most other world religions. Three, according to this belief, the central goal of life is to be happy, And to feel good about yourself. That's the central goal. Self-actualization, if you will. Number four. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life, except when you need God to resolve one of your problems. And number five. Good people go to heaven when they die. Does that sound about accurate? Like, isn't that what you hear Dr. Phil say? Oprah, like, isn't that what you hear in a lot of watered-down churches? Right? Like, God's good. He wants you to be good. And if you're good, good things will happen to you. And you don't really need God all that much until something bad happens, that, that there's circumstances that come in front of you that you can't deal with on your own, and so now you need God to do something for you. This is basically the, the way our world functions, isn't it? Now, I mention this because... Just like fish don't realize they're surrounded by water, but it affects everything they do, so we don't realize the cultural currents of the worldviews that surround us, and yet they affect everything we do. And so then we can see this come into our lives when bad things happen to us, and we say, God, are you even there? Are you good still? Because we believe that basically the point of my life is to be happy. But this is incredibly dangerous. This isn't something that the Bible teaches. God's goals for your life are so much greater than your happiness. You have to believe that. God wants more for you than just being comfortable. God's goals for you are higher 
than this. And sometimes he can use suffering to advance his goals for your life. So this isn't what the Bible teaches, this moralistic therapeutic deism. And you need to know that because if you don't understand this, if you think you believe in God but you actually believe in America's version of God, then when suffering does come into your life, it'll smack you in the face like a tidal wave. It will knock you down. You won't know what hit you and you won't know how to get yourself back off the ground. God's word gives us hope that heals in a world that hurts. We actually have some tools to deal with these things. See, if you read back through Genesis 37 through 50, you'll find Joseph, he's not completely innocent. Tim Keller talks about this in his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, that, that all suffering is both just and unjust. All suffering is just in the fact that we have sinned fallen short of the glory of God. And one offense against the king of heaven is worthy of an eternity in hell. So nobody suffers completely innocently. Still, we live in a jacked up world with jacked up people who hurt us when we don't deserve it. And so suffering can be both just and it's unjust. And today we're dealing with the unjust side. Now when you read through Genesis 37 through 50, what you will find is is Joseph going from bad to worse. Just when you, it seems like there's a light starting to shine in his life, just when it seems like the dawn is going to break through the clouds, it gets worse. But throughout the entire narrative, there's a phrase that's repeated. It's that God was with Joseph. Things go from bad to worse, but God never leaves him. God had a plan for Joseph's life and the most ruthless, heartless sin that people could throw at him could not derail God's intentions to glorify his name through Joseph's life. No one could stop that because God is the sovereign king of the universe and he has intentions for your life that are greater than your happiness, that are greater than your comfort. And when people sin against you, when people try to throw you off of the rails of where God is taking you, you need to know that God's grace and his goodness and his power will sovereignly overrule everyone's attempt for God to maximize his glory in your life. No one's going to stop him. Even when the dark, even when the night looks dark, God's not going to be stopped. So when people intentionally hurt you and sin against you, they violate your confidence. Do not believe for a second that God has forgotten you, that He's not with you. The cross promises God will never leave you nor forsake you. No one will stop God from glorifying his name in your life. Now, why do these things happen to us? Joseph had the opportunity of seeing some very specific things. He got to see how God used him to, to uh, help a nation and, and a, a continent, probably, overcome a famine. We may not get to see all the specific reasons of why God has allowed suffering to come into our lives, but there is one there is one that you will see. And you will have an opportunity to see it again and again and again and again. And it's painful, but it's beautiful, and it will bring you closer to God than anything else that I know. When people sin against you, you will have an opportunity to embrace and extend the gospel. I am convinced that nothing puts the gospel on display more than people absorbing the sin of other people and forgiving them. Just like Jesus absorbed our sin on the cross in order to forgive us. The ultimate point of our lives is to point people to the glory of God through the display of the gospel. And you see that this is more than saving a handful of temporal lives. This is what Joseph's life did. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold for 20 pieces of silver. 
He was sentenced to spend the rest of his life as a slave. But eventually, God would exalt Joseph to the highest position in the most powerful nation in the world. And this points us to Christ. Because Jesus was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And he died on the cross to pay the penalty for us living our lives as slaves to sin. And eventually, God raised him from the dead and exalted Christ to the highest position of honor and power in all of creation, the ruling king of the universe. Now, when we do not repay evil with evil, but dig deep into that empty grave to find the grace to overcome, to overpower evil with good, that makes God look glorious. That makes God look beautiful. And if you want to encounter the power of God, you need to be willing to take that step. Often I think that people want to see God do something miraculous in their lives, and what they're hoping for is to watch water turn into wine, or... um, All kinds of other things. But if you want to feel the power of God, forgive. When you suffer innocently, not not returning evil for evil, you will feel the power of God pulsating through your veins because that kind of love and that kind of strength, it has to come from another world. It has to come from another heart and not mine. It has to come from his. The only place your anger is safe is at the cross. The only place your weakness is protected is by the throne of the king of the universe. The only place where your heart can be healed is in the empty grave of Christ. Hold on to him. Now when you believe that and you place all of your hope and all of your confidence in him, that then gives you the ability to face the unjust suffering in this world. But you need to embrace that. And until you do, you'll be walking through the steps and you'll be, if anything, you'll just fill yourself up with pride and you'll wind up thinking that you're better than everybody else because at least you forgive rather than realizing that you're just as bad as everybody else because God needed to forgive you. Martin Luther put it this way. He said that Christians cannot suffer with Christ before they have embraced the full benefits of Christ's suffering for them. So why does God allow suffering into into our lives? Why does God allow people to hurt us? It is so that we can embrace and extend the gospel so that in powerful, painful, beautiful ways we can point God to the glory of God. We can point people to the glory of God through the gospel, through us living it out. This is what what the author says in Genesis 50-20. God allows these things into our lives so that he can overcome evil with good. You intended it for evil, God intended it for good. How then? How do we walk this out? What do we do? The answer to that question is tucked away in the the previous verse, Genesis 50, 19. Joseph tells his brothers not to be afraid because he's not in the place of God. How do you walk through unjust suffering? You trust God. In Romans uh, the Apostle Paul writes, do not, repay, do not repay evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not take on vengeance, because vengeance belongs to God. So we trust God. We look at the cross. God has guaranteed, at the cost of his only son, that the smallest injustice will be fully paid for. God's not going to let any sin go unpunished. It will be taken care of one way or another. You can trust God to protect you, to defend you, to carry you. And when you trust God to defend you, there is incredible freedom in that. I remember being a kid, having a hard time with some of my neighbors. A uh, handful of older kids, just a couple years older than me, uh, ganged up on me for something I forget what exactly. But I remember being really distraught and feeling like, ah, what do I do? I can't fight back. They're bigger. They're older. What do I do? Well, I went home. And I told my big brother, this is what these kids did to me. 
my big brother went and set things straight. (laughs) Church, we have a better big brother than that. (laughs) And if your big brother would would go out and defend you in ways that you couldn't defend yourself, how much more will Christ, who died for you, how much more will he go and defend you? Tell me, church, think about this. How much time would you get back if you didn't have to replay those tapes over and over and over again in your mind? Wondering what you should have said, what you could have said, what you will say next time. How much more energy would you get back into your day if you didn't have to plot and plan how you're going to avoid certain people or get back at certain people? What if you could just trust God? This is the freedom we have through Christ. This is the freedom the gospel gives Ken Sandy says that when we get hurt, there's really only three main ways we can, we can deal with, with this. We can either be peace breakers, peace keepers, or peacemakers. If we are going to be peace breakers, so you have to, you have to just examine yourself and, and ask yourself, how do you respond when people sin against you? These are our three tendencies. To either break the peace, keep the peace, Or be used by God to make some peace. People who want to break the peace, they tend to worship power and control. Because they, what? You did that to, you don't talk to me like that. They lash out. Do you think that there's over, there's been over 50 reported homicides this year for no reason? Just in this city? Just what's been reported? Peacekeepers, on the other hand, peacekeepers, they worship approval and comfort. Because peacekeepers, they'll, wait, you said that to me? You're mad at me? Oh, don't be mad at me. Here, let me make it better. And so they'll sweep the sin under the rug, bend over backwards to try to keep people happy, but the gospel gives us a better option. And we see that We see that in Joseph's life. If you notice when we read through that passage, Joseph didn't ignore the sin, did he? No, you you did evil. You did it. He's not ignoring that. He's not pretending that they didn't sin against him. He says, you did evil against me. But he doesn't attack them either, does he? No. (laughs) You know why not? They already repented. See, The Bible is clear in several different places that when people sin against you, you need to confront that sin. If you know that somebody is caught in a pattern of sin, you who are spiritual should restore him but keep watch on yourself so that you don't fall into the same temptation. Matthew 18, if somebody has sinned against you, go and show him his fault. If he repents, great. If not, go bring two more. There's places in the scripture where are clear that when people are in sin, we need to confront that. And, and we, don't, we don't get to abdicate that responsibility just because the sin has been committed against us. So I'm not talking about being a pushover. I'm not talking about pretending that people haven't sinned against you. I'm not saying that. We need to deal with this. Because if you believe what the Bible says, that sin poisons a soul, and eventually it will strangle that soul and condemn it to hell, if you believe that, and you know someone's in sin and it's coming out sideways against you, you better do something about it. But, when you embrace the gospel, you don't have to take on God's job, right? It's not your responsibility to change a heart. And every time you read in the Bible about confronting sin, the aim is always restoration, repentance, reconciliation. And you see that happen here in Genesis 50. Through the gospel, God has given us the opportunity to be reconciled to God and then to each other. We can have this. It's before us. And when Joseph saw that that was in place, he didn't have to punish them anymore. They repented. They were able to reconcile. Now this does not mean that you need to just turn around and and trust everybody who has hurt you. I'm not saying that. Forgiveness needs to be freely given. Trust needs to be earned. Forgiveness need, needs, needs to be freely given. Forgive each other as in Christ you have been forgiven. Trust is a different thing altogether. Trust can be earned. 
but we need to believe, apply, embrace, and extend the gospel. And this church, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where God can use you to change this world. If every time somebody hits you, you have to hit back or retreat, what's going to get better? What's going to change? If you instinctively need to hit back every time you're hit or run away every time you're threatened, do you realize that you have decided to be controlled by the lowest level of health and maturity around you for the rest of your life? That's your decision. But God has given us the grace to be controlled by him by his power and his goodness for his glory. We don't have to repay evil for evil. We can overcome evil with good. Don't you want this? Don't you want to see it end? Don't you want to see it stop? Don't you want to have peace in your home? Don't you want to be able to read the newspaper and not see that people are still shooting each other? Don't you want that? It's got to start, it's got to start here. It's got to start with you. Because it already started with Christ. He already took the first step. He absorbed all of the evil and all of the sin in his body, dying for us on the cross. And so now we can step out with that confidence and that power. See, because everybody knows how to respond when they get hit. Everybody knows how to hit back. Everybody knows how to run away. Just watch kids play. (laughs) They know how to do this. But do you know what nobody anticipates? Nobody anticipates getting hugged after they take a swing. Nobody even knows how to respond when God's goodness and grace overpowers evil with good. It's because it doesn't come from this world. It comes from a better world. It comes from the world we're going to because of what Jesus has done for us. And when you, when you have sinned against someone else and they have every right to blast you or ignore you, but they don't, how does that make you feel? When you know someone has seen the darkest pit of your soul and still says, I love you, what words are left? It's hard to even breathe if you know the depth of your own sin. And when you have been sinned against and you have every right to blast someone or cut off the relationship, but you don't even any longer feel the desire to do that because your heart has been given a greater desire Like, your desire now isn't to see them squirm, isn't to see them pay, but is to see them set free? Then your breath is taken away. This is what it means to follow Christ. This is the power that God gives us. It doesn't make sense, and it's not supposed to. We're talking about following a powerful, supernatural God who will be at work in your heart if you believe. So embrace the gospel, extend the gospel, and when we do this, God then will give hope to a world that hurts to show that he has real healing. I want to see God's kingdom break through the darkness. I want to see God do something in my life that's going to matter. I don't want to stand on the sidelines and just say I'm okay with the status quo anymore. I want to see God use you. I want to see God move you out into this world so that we together put the glory of God on display in a way that no one else can through the local church being the church, acting like we believe what God's word actually says, like he has done something in our hearts and now we rely on his spirit and his power to demonstrate his glory and his grace to his world. And when this happens, God will use us to answer a prayer. St. Francis of Assisi, some 800 years ago, he prayed this. 
Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Injury, pardon. Where there is error, the truth. Where there is doubt, the faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And when there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not seek, I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we cannot avoid this. As much as we may want to, it is not an option we have in this sinful world. And so God, I pray Revive our hearts, stir our souls, give us such a firm confidence in you that we might be able to forgive, we might be able to confront, we might be able to deal with sin in the way that you have, even the sin that's committed against us. God, give us the power to live out the image of God in this world. For your glory and our good, we pray. Amen.